The following is a bonus episode of The Dental Guys. Well, you're listening to The Dental Guys live from Spear Summit discussing Frank Spear's most recent lecture, like fresh off of the stage there, I wish I knew what I thought I once did. Hmm. And here today is Frank Spear and Greg Kinzer to discuss just this topic. John, I'm excited about this. Yeah. And First of all, thanks for being with us, guys. It's an honor to get to uh, to share uh, this uh, little area with you, and it's a great setup you guys have uh, for us here. Um, I want to just go right into, you know, not everybody that's listening to this may have heard the, the whole lecture, so I want to maybe just... Uh, just a little recap of what you spoke about. You know, the, the first thing you start, started with was uh, the quote, beware of false knowledge. It is more dangerous than ignorance. And uh, that is something that uh, really speaks to the, the, the whole topic there of, of what we think we know. And I want you to maybe go through and just recap a little bit about what you spoke about there as far as what we, what, it, what we can get in trouble with when we think we know things. And a little bit, you went through a journey of your understanding of Bruxism and kind of use that as a way to, 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 to trace that. So tell us a little bit about, just kind of recap that for our listeners. Yeah, so for, for me, uh, the whole concept of putting that 30 minutes together was sort of to help people identify the simple fact that as we get older and we have more research and we get more information, we discover that some of the things we held true early on turned out to not be true which creates quite a bit of discomfort in most dentists. And then because discomfort makes us want to look for an answer, we kind of go to a different lecturer (laughs) or we find a different piece of research and suddenly we think we're comfortable again, but it still may not be true. So I use bruxism just as a really specific example, only because literally when I was trained, I mean, starting, I think my first lecture that involved nathology would have been like spring of 1975. And it was clear, you know, I was a dental student at the time, but it was clear that we were supposed to memorize a paragraph out of Ramford Nash's textbook on occlusion. And that paragraph literally was, what is the etiology of bruxism? Mm. And the paragraph clearly stated that the etiology of bruxism is occlusal interferences, which then lead to this you know, cyclic pattern of masticatory behaviors. And by the time I got to be a grad student, I mean, we had just been inundated with that. Mm-hmm. And so you believe that if you saw a patient with tooth wear and you saw a patient that, you know, brux, yeah. that your treatment was to fix their bite. Yeah, equilibration, right? Yeah, totally, or sometimes worse. I mean, I can tell you that I, I took patients, you know, in the 80s that I restored posterior teeth with onlays to make them have CR equal their intercuspal position and to give them their little tripod contacts yeah. and to do all the stuff. Because that's what I believe. Because you knew it was true. And, yeah. and so when you talk about that whole thing about ignorance, the false knowledge is there's a lot of patients that I frankly treated that did not need any treatment. Wow. And not to mention the treatment wasn't going to make them better anyway. Mm-hmm. And so the, the gist of what I was trying to, to do this morning was to say, okay, so that was false knowledge then. <laughs> and now what's the journey along the way? And, you know, the, the airway piece has become really big, but initially the airway piece was a very different message. It was all about sleep and it was about apnea. Yep. And it, you know, apnea and hypopneas were what you had to fix next. So every person that had bruxism now got a sleep study. Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and it was just, it was a perpetuation of the same kind of false knowledge because not every patient with bruxism has apnea or hypopnea. Yep. Um, so I think the, the message was really about Number one, be aware is how, uh, how aggressive is your treatment based on your belief about what you think you know. Um, and it's also about the reality is we're never going to be totally comfortable. Right. Mm-hmm. We're not. Right. Because we're never going to really know. But isn't change hard? Totally. Yeah. Which is why all of us would much prefer it. Right. If we actually could say this is the answer and don't you try to find people like it's the psyche to find people that believe what you believe and you only surround yourself confirmation bias right yes totally yeah we want that so badly and we want to be able to give answers to our patients we want to be able to say i know exactly 
what's going on here. <laughs> yeah. And I know exactly how to fix you yeah. because that is so satisfying and that's what they come there for. Yeah. yeah. And so to be able to say to somebody, I mean, this is, we're dealing with this in our own practices with, with airway. And we, you know, we have a, a team of people, a pediatric ENT and a pediatric sleep study that our sleep center that we meet at. And we have pediatric dentists and we talk about this all the time. How, what is, what do we do with these people? What do, what can we say with, with confidence about these kids and what are they going to, how's this going to affect their growth and how's this going to affect it? And there's things we feel like we could say a couple of years ago, and now we're not sure if we should say, and some of these things are a Alarming if you start saying them and you, mm. you have like you say the aggressiveness of your treatment or even of your statements uh, Especially when it gets into airway. Yeah. you have to be careful and, and I think you know and Greg can really speak to this because you know Jeff Rouse was up in Seattle for two years in the office and great so Greg and Jeff spent a ton of time together and developed the Seattle protocol and I, I think the thing that I really enjoy about the approach they're taking which honestly concerns me with just people that focus on sleep apnea mm. is when you focus on sleep apnea most of your patients are going to get a sleep apneic appliance right and those <clears throat> are not reversible appliances if you wear them for very long yep and so suddenly you think you're doing the right thing but even that appliance is a pretty aggressive form of treatment and the person who suddenly two years later their posterior teeth are five millimeters right. apart I remember the Steve Carsonson when we were in the workshop just standing who said, just first of all, just get it out of the way. You're, all these patients eventually probably need ortho. You know, he kind of just made yeah. this, it, it's, yeah. it's gonna change things. Right. And, and maybe, so. and he talked about, you know, the, the thinker pose to try to get, you know, people to get back where they were and all these things we tried to do. But yeah, it's, it sounds so easy. These are not, They're you not. know, easy things to talk about. So you, you used um, bruxism and sleep apnea to kind of describe this, this whole you know, thing that we're talking about here is that we, you know, we really have to have an open mind mm. always and always, always. challenge mm, what yeah. we are studying. And Greg, maybe I could point this question to you is let's change up what we think about dental implants now mm -hmm. that we really wish we would have known back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And and I want you to speak to specifically, John and I are interested in hearing is what really matters right now when it comes to surgical placement? Uh, does connection matter? Um, does implant design matter? There's so many things that we've been challenged on that really have changed. And some of it, you know, I think that has to do with just engineering in, in principle. But what do you wish that you, you, you would have known back then? You know, it's, uh, implants are interesting because they had an evolution as well. Um, we had success with implants and the old Brandemark style implants, right? External connection, not the best design from a, from a fit standpoint, from a biologic standpoint, but you can go back in the literature and you can find integration that was, was good and you can find really nice aesthetics. Right. So where things have evolved to from a manufacturer standpoint is, yeah, connection does matter. That's why all the implant systems now have accommodated into an internal connection, and horizontal off, offset platform switch. But I think um, our thought of implants has evolved. The goal with implants used to be integration. If you integrated, congratulations, you did a great job, you won. And now we have such an aesthetically discerning clientele or ourselves are more aesthetically uh, discerning that the aesthetics of implants are paramount. Mm. And if you look, there's, there's ways, I mean, it used to be all subjective, whether you liked it or not. And now there's objective ways to evaluate the aesthetics of an implant. There's pink aesthetic scores, there's white aesthetic mm -hmm. scores. And if you look at the research, and some of the research like from Belzer's group, um, we're not as good with implant dentistry from an aesthetic standpoint as we would hope to be, especially mm -hmm. at this point in, in the dental you know, scheme of things. So right now, the idea of getting implants to be predictable from an aesthetic standpoint is what's pushing people mm. and the most important aspect of that soft tissue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean using implants getting them in the right aesthetic position from a from a placement standpoint is paramount right because it's almost impossible if you have a malpositioned implant but we should be able to do that with hard tissue augmentation but soft tissue is still going to be our, our aesthetic key I believe mm -hmm. we yep. heard uh, Sandra lazy say at the AO a few years ago and it's one of our favorite quotes is that surgery doesn't stop when the implant is placed mm -hmm. now now it continues 
of what we do on that implant the day of surgery. Mm -hmm. And Frank, tell me, has that is that really changed? Was that? Well, it's fascinating to me that Greg brought up the old the old smooth surface Brandemark implants. Is the first thing you brought up. Um, if you know, if you because I know you guys like literature. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, we we'll drink it. <laughs> if, you, if you try to go look up success stories or, and survival stories on implants, and you start looking for any study that has a decent number of implants that are 30 years old or older. As far as I know, there's one on five mandibular uh, medentulous cases, but the only one that really does implants the way we would talk about it today um, is Myra Nevin's study that was done on, and it's up to 32 years. And he's got 32-year-old cases where, you know, the bone went to the first thread, stopped. He can show you the pictures of those implants, the aesthetics. They look pretty dang good. Yeah. I, I've got some... I guess my oldest ones would be about 20. My, my oldest Brandemark single tooth ones would be by 1988-89, so close to 30 years. Um, and then what's fascinating to me also is, you know, we, today there's the whole, is it cement retained, is it screw retained, cement's a bad thing, cement causes bone loss. All of our implant cases back in the 80s and 90s on the smooth surface, they were all cement retained almost. Right. Because that was just what we did, yep. and they were cemented with zinc oxide eugenol. Right, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were, and that, yeah, like we've we've heard, you know, Shandra Wadwani talk about this whole idea of maybe bioactivity of cements and whether you know the zinc was actually protective, and maybe that's I mean, the I, thing. I, I can tell you, I, I have photos of cases I did in the '80s, cemented restorations, where. In the post-op photo, I can see the white of the temp bond that went down the abutment <laughs> at the recall, and I had to take an explorer and pick it out, yeah. and yet the implant did phenomenal. Right. right. And so it's fascinating to me that we've, we've, in some ways, quote, tried to improve the technology of the implant itself and the connection. Um, certainly, we're way better with bone and tissue. I mean, there's no question, bone and tissue, and I, I'm all with Greg. Soft tissue to me is everything. But um, the, the thing that I think is really curious is what is it about the modern designs and the modern cements that we're just encountering things that we honestly didn't encounter yes. in, the, in the implants from the 80s and 90s. But I think part of it has to be with the mass number of restorations that are done now versus when implants were in their infancy, right? Yeah, that's probably the sample true. size? Yeah, the people that did them back in the day were people that were on the cutting edge and they they maybe they were like yourself more skilled and now it's the masses it's everybody does it no matter what your skill level is it's a part of your your dentistry yeah, could be so yeah. honestly that could be yeah that, that's very possible you know I, when i was trained because when i got out of my paraprost program we didn't have implants yet i mean they brandemark implants weren't in the u.s yet and when when brandemark brought them to the u.s um the only people that were allowed to place them were oral surgeons. Yes. A periodontist couldn't even place one. Mm -hmm. And the only people that were allowed to restore them were prosthodontists. Mm -hmm. So if you went to a training program in the early 80s, there was the prost program that they ran around put on to train the prosthodontists how to restore the things. And then there was the placement program and oral surgeons. And if you didn't have a, a number, like a course serial number, mm. registered with Brandmark, you couldn't buy a part. Crazy. Wow. That's crazy. Um, so it was a it was a really limited number of people that were actually placing restoring implants in the eighties, Brandemark implants. Mm -hmm. Corvent took the road of we want to sell them to everybody, mm -hmm. but people were still really afraid. Um, I think Greg's probably right in that the one area as more and more people place them, you can't take the same thought process of process of placing a an upper premolar implant and assume that you're going to take out a central or lateral and put in an anterior implant and mm -hmm. do nothing else except take the tooth out and stick the implant in right. and then end up with a nice result. I exactly. Mean. And so I think that's, Greg's probably right on that, that. And I also think that the cements that were used back then were tampon and ZOE cements, which are significantly kinder than some of the yes. resin cements glass and onomer. glass yeah. onomers that are out there now mm -hmm. that that flow better and and once they're set you will never be able to get it out well and that was a th you know like i said when 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 Wondwani published that i mean he showed that multi-link implant cement was essentially equivalent to to bacterial media like it was essentially like feeding the bacteria and i you know it, it definitely made us think again this all comes back to well that fits with what my brain wants to think, yeah. right? It want, it, like I want to think that, yeah. yes, yeah. I want to believe that because so I want to believe it's not, it's not 
uh, off-label parts. Right. It's not, you know, uh, we can use uh, mm. non-OEM parts and save a few bucks, or can we? Or is it that our skills, are, are we're not very good as, as general dentists maybe doing this? They're not doing it at a high level, or is the surgery not as good? Or is it really that that just confirms what I want to believe, which, no, it's all the cement. You know, it's well, interesting. And, but I do think... Um, talking about the, the the research and the change, one of the major changes that I think we see today in literature is implants that actually have been doing fine for 10 years or 12 years and then explode. Yes, mm. yes. And I don't care who placed it right. or who restored it. Yeah. It's your brain just like, how did that happen? Yes, so that's what's challenged us recently is, oh, yeah. is really what is causing failure late failure late failure we're not talking like early failure less than a year yeah. we're talking five years plus yeah john and i are really starting to see that sometimes in our career like i have a patient that you know underwent uh periodontal you know he, he had everything you could do to try to save his teeth it's basically the quintessential refractory periodontal disease loses his teeth well, what do you do you, do you slick him you throw in six implants okay. on the upper six, and you know, he's walking, you know, down the road beautifully for five years. I've got panorex after panorex, year to year, bone levels normal, normal, normal. Mm -hmm. At five years, mm -hmm. something happens and 50% right. bone loss. Yep. How do we explain that? And, and I think that there's and, a lot of research. Yeah, and, and Thomas Albertson, you know, we were at the AO a couple of years ago and his little, and his, his just kind of small lecture, and he kind of introduced this idea of like steady state equilibrium between foreign body rejection by the body, and is it pro-inflammatory factors that certain people have, mm. but why does that show itself at 10 years out or, and not at two years out? Yeah, and that's the challenge of working on a, a biologic system because it, because it continually changes, mm. you know. I know Jeff would put the airway spin, that there's an <laughs> airway change and that's now changing the host factors and all of a sudden we can have these problems. So mm. it's one of these that at this point we don't know or at least we maybe think we know what it is, but just like what you said, we only know what we know now. Yeah, and, and the good news is we, before we started having these 10-year failures, we thought these were gonna last forever. Right. So if you talk about my, my quote about ignorance, yeah, you know, of, false knowledge the trouble with believing an implant lasts forever mm. is it makes it so easy for you to take the tooth out mm. so true that is so you're, challenging. you wow. take a you take a 20 year old 25 year old 30 year old you got a fractured tooth uh, do i really want to do the endo and the post core what the heck implants last forever why would we do that let's just right. take the tooth out and stick the implant and it's an in. easy case to make to the patient so as easy. well and you know? yet so here we are because we have that belief we take that action and then now, you know, if you look at the literature on what happens when you have to put an implant in a failed site, mm -hmm. yes. mm -hmm. and if you have to put in a third implant because it fails again, yep. and your, your success rates are down in the 50s and 60s, yep. whereas you talk to most people and say, hey, where, where's the success rates of implants? Oh, they're in the 90s. Mm. Right. Well, for how long? Exactly. Right. And so th th that sort of the stuff that I was using, the Bruxism example, it's the same concern. It's when you think that you know, like you think that an implant is li literally going to be there forever. Right. It does make your decision. You know, and John and I have these conversations that we have changed the way we present treatment to patients. Mm -hmm. Because we used to tell patients, I used to tell patients that once you have this implant place, you'll never have to worry about number 19 again. Mm -hmm. You know, and or it's very unlikely at least. Very you unlikely, say, you know. And you... and I still tell patients it's a good restoration mm -hmm, and sure. all those things. But I'm <clears throat> all the time using the words that you've taught us to use: revision. Yeah, revisions. Revisions that it could possibly require revisions. You know, and and that's hard for us to say. That's I mean, it is because maybe, you don't want to fail. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned replacing these restorations on this on this patient three times. You know, broke every tooth even after you had done all of your all of the mm. things that you knew that you just had to get right and then we would be good and then they broke every tooth and of course i never told her i told her i thought she'd be a complete success right of so course. you can imagine how angry she was after yeah. a year and a half of breaking everything right and with implants the stakes are just higher yeah in a lot of ways you know so we we do a lot of implant education here at spear education and we're we're trying to make make the outcomes better and more predictable but it, when push comes to shove, we'll be the first ones to tell you that if we can save the teeth, we should save the teeth. Mm. Because if you, even if you can save it for, let's say five years, seven years, think of what's gonna happen in the evolution of our knowledge and techniques mm. with implants. We might have an option in five or seven years that we don't have now that we can do it even better than we could. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's delaying something for the, the overall success. And, and I, would, I would add to that, uh, I think the factor that really impacts that for me is give me the age and health of the patient. Mm -hmm. The younger the patient, the more I'm gonna try and keep teeth. Well, right. and I love that, you, you know, the, when you did the, the keynote at the AO, yeah. And you showed, yeah. you so know, good. case yeah. after case, you know, yeah. horizontal root fractures. Yeah. And then, you know, you would see it and you'd say, well, you know, what would you do here? Right. You'd definitely take this one out. Mm -hmm. And then you show another radiograph. And then if you didn't know how much time had passed, you had no idea that yeah. was 10 years. That was 15 years. Yeah. And, and so it, it really it really changes the way we think about these these cases when you realize what's possible. Yeah. And but so so if you. Uh, you look at that and you think so from an education standpoint I feel like implants are probably one of the areas though that that there's <laughs> that there is a problem yeah that there is a problem in terms of because where are where are especially newer doctors maybe getting their knowledge about uh, how to restore implants uh, it seems like you know in, even in dental schools today it's very rare that they're getting restorative experience even with an, a, an implant, except for a lecture. Is that what you guys are seeing with, with students that you see come through your implant uh, restorative types of courses? Yeah, I mean, if you think about the, the age of the practitioner, the older the practitioner, they maybe haven't done it, are scared to do it, don't really want to get in. I've already lived my career. I, I, I didn't have to do them then, so I don't have to do them now, but now, I want to learn, mm. um, and then the newer practitioners, as you said, they might they might get to hear a few lectures in school. Maybe they get to do one implant, probably not a lot more than that. And so, when you get out, you have no knowledge and clinical skills, or let's say limited. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why you you might start to see more issues with implants now. Mm -hmm. And and implants are challenging when we have control from the beginning as an experienced team. When you have an implant that has problems, that's unhealthy, that's diseased, that's malpositioned, it's almost impossible to try to make it look perfect. And so we're seeing in the practice a lot of patients coming in for retreats of implants. And yeah. it's, man, that's a challenging that's one. That's so us. challenging. Yeah. Speak yeah. to a little bit about what Spear is doing to just raise the level of prosthetic design and driven driving the surgery you know f first looking at the classic spear way of diagnosing you know airway aesthetics you know all the the standard thing and how you're using that to help dentists that don't have maybe the training they need to really help their surgeons place a better implant and maybe because i think it really john and i talked about this earlier today is that i feel like my career in in dentistry as far as implant dentistry goes it excelled when I understood how to restore dental mm -hmm. implants, but it seems like it's being sold the other way today is like, go learn how to place dental implants and you'll get this. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm a little concerned about that. And you guys have some seminars that you're putting on. Tell us a little bit about what you're trying to do in those seminars. So the seminar that we run with implants, um, implants on, on teeth, so like a fixed implant versus let's say an edentulous arch, it's done with uh, an interdisciplinary approach. So we have a surgeon and a restorative dentist. So it's Jim Janikowski, a periodontist, and myself. Because to truly understand the outcome, you need both pieces. Um, and I'm not saying that general dentists can't place implants and do it well, but I think that having the surgeon who's trained in it and having the restorative side, it makes sense to think about it, to be able to teach about it. Mm -hmm. So we, we start with a restorative driven plan. Where do we want, it's like FGTP, where do we want the teeth, where do we want the tissue? And then we use, we use some of the literature to kind of identify where the bone is and where the tissue is with different treatment options. So we pre-prosthetically evaluate where's the bone and tissue. And then as a team, we talk orthodontically and surgically about, all right, what can you do to help move things into a more predictable position for our outcome? Mm. And the benefit of that is if you think about how well we do implants, which is aesthetically not well, at least from the literature. If the patient comes in and thinks that they're gonna look perfect, like a natural tooth, and I know darn well that they're not, I need to be able to have a conversation with them about the expected outcome, right? Set the bar for them, set mm -hmm. their expectation bar. So the, the treatment planning aspect, I still think is one of the most valid things. But then we walk through techniques, right? So once you understand the treatment planning, the techniques start to become very, very important, both from a surgical and a restorative side. Gotcha. 
And I feel like that's the way that um, no matter what level you're at, you know, you need to understand the restorative side first, even as a surgeon. I mean, I think that that's where Absolutely. we have seen the, the greatest, you know, advances mm. in our uh, our own practices with our surgeons is being able to and when they I get go, it, you know when man, we went yeah. to i took my periodontist we went to a seminar here he's here yeah he's here he's yeah. here today yeah and uh you know that that discussion at dinner was mm. a very good discussion you know because you you have the you you realize what you can and can't ac achieve um and you realize how much how important ortho is in a lot of these yep. cases and you really start to say okay we need to be talking about things a little differently yeah That's i huge. know i know jim says that when he was teaching it uh in the undergrad or in the, the perio grad program um the students want to know how to do implants like right? they're just gung-ho to do implants and he would give them a restorative manual and say all right before we actually do anything surgically, you need to understand this. Yeah, What's You need to understand the restorative yeah, side yeah. because what you do will impact what can be done by the restorative dentist. Right. Before you start prepping teeth in dental school, we carved wax and did little wax ups. Right. You understood anatomy first before you actually did a prep. Yeah. It's no different. You, yeah, you need to have the final outcome before you start yes. going That's, underneath. Just right. not take it away before yeah. you understand what yeah. it looks right. like. If you've yeah. done yeah. anything here it's for education, yeah. you know yeah. that uh, it's all it's it's all dentures in the end. It right? starts it's with all, the end in mind. It's, it's, it's it. easy. That's it. <laughs> so good. Well, that's that's a great way to uh, to to you know I think to close this time. It's 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 so good to be able to to talk about this stuff with you guys. I think that what we've seen through Summit, and one of the things I maybe want to talk just briefly about is just you know. Um, we've seen this this community you know one of the things that happened you know you got on stage with Harold and you guys are talking about you know some things about your history <laughs> which I'll kind of remain, <laughs> yeah, we'll probably remain a good nameless idea. for right. this yeah <laughs> but I mean you you know it's it, it's clear here that this is a unique meeting it's unique because it is a community it's a it's a family feel and I think that uh, that's a really cool thing to be able to be a part of that, where people come here not just to, to learn, but they come here because that, that, again, that time after the meeting, just like my periodontist and I had after that seminar, is really where a lot of the, uh, the real stuff goes on. Right. And so I think it's pretty awesome that this has uh, grown to what it is. It's got to make you guys uh, very proud, you know, of just being be able to be part of that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty actually it's pretty shocking thinking, you know, 10 years ago when I came from Seattle and brought the, biz the teaching business from Seattle down here. I don't know that uh, I would ever in my life have had a vision of what this has all become. So. Yeah, we heard that Spear Summit started out with like 200 or less people. Correct, yeah. And now today, I think 1,100 people yeah, I from think what I was hearing. Like that. That's amazing. So, yeah. And so that that's really special. Well, we sure appreciate you guys being with us, and uh, we may be spending some more time over the yeah. next couple of days talking more about this. And uh, uh, we want to make sure, too, that uh, tomorrow, that you know, if you're listening to this now, that you check in for the post-lecture interview uh, after the art, it's called The Art of Inspiring Change and Creating Culture. Uh, also, too, if, if anybody has any questions, we want you to leave them in the comments uh, below this so that we can respond to those, maybe even on the next live stream that we do. So if you have some good questions for our speakers, you know, we can actually maybe relay those. Now, they have to be good questions, you know. They can't just be what's your favorite soda, as, as uh, I've heard <laughs> I knew, has I knew been asked before, up. you know. to Yeah, they got to be high level, you know. But if you have some good questions, leave them in the comments, and we may, you got, your question may make it live on the show. Uh, Frank and Greg, once again, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you it. very much. Thanks for listening to that bonus episode of The Dental Guys. If you want to connect with us, check us out on thedentalguys.net or hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, and now Instagram. Thanks for listening.